Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Hello, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, my name is Amelia Mann, and I'm the Interim College Counseling Director. Um, I really appreciate everyone being here. Um, and fill me in, how was the game? Oh, okay, all right. I figured it didn't feel like that was the energy I was looking for, so yeah. All right, well, I appreciate you finishing your, out your night with us. Um, I am going to introduce this amazing group of people. Um, I am so thrilled they're here. I was not sure if they were all going to be able to make it. So this is pretty phenomenal that we are able to do this event um, live and in person. Um, so give me a moment and I'm going to go ahead and introduce them. And then they're going to tell you a little bit about themselves. So this is Dr. And Andrea Felder. She is the Assistant Vice Provost for Undergraduate Admissions at the American University in Washington, D.C. Um, next to her is Mr. Heath Einstein, and the dean of admission. He's the dean of admissions at Texas Christian University in Fort Worth, Texas. And then we have Mr. Kerry Thompson. He's the vice president of enrollment and educational services at Gettysburg College in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Ms. Sally Stone Richmond is the vice president for admissions and financial aid at Washington and Lee University in Lexington, Virginia. And then we have, last but not least, Dr. Tyler Peterson. He serves as the Executive Director of Admissions and Financial Aid and Scholarships at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. So when you look up here at this panel, including myself, you've got about 160 years of experience. Yeah, so um, you're, gonna, you're gonna be hit with some wisdom tonight, folks. I hope you're ready. Um, <laughs> So, no pressure, y'all. Um, they are going to go ahead and just introduce themselves a little bit in their background and how they came to be working at the institutions um, that they are currently at. And then um, we're going to just engage in some questions. At the very end, we'll have an opportunity for you all to ask questions. So don't be shy. Um, hold those questions, be thinking about them, and then, and then we'll jump into it and give you some time at the end to, to reach out to our panelists and ask your, your questions. All right, so we'll go ahead and start with uh, Dr. Felder. Hi, good evening, everyone. Again, my name is Andrea Felder, Assistant Vice Provost for Undergraduate Admissions at uh, American University in Washington, D.C. That is quite a mouthful. Um, Amelia just made me feel a little older. Uh, not to mention I have a birthday coming up in a couple weeks, so I really feel old. Um, so I've been at the American University for about five years. Um, American is a private, mid-sized university right in the heart of Washington, D.C. Um, we have about 8,000 undergraduates and about 6,000 graduate professional students, so about 14,000 students overall. Prior to my time at American University, I was at a much larger institution, the University of Florida in Gainesville, Florida, so go Gators if there are any Gators in the house. Um, I was there for about three years. Um, serving as the Director of Freshman and International Admissions at um, UF. And then I started my career in admissions at the University of North Carolina at, at Chapel Hill, so go Tar Heels. Um, I am a Tar Heel, Tar Heel born bred. Uh, when I die, I'll be a Tar Heel dead. Um, I'm also a Carolina graduate as well. Um, loved my time at the university, um, but it's been great being back home. So I'm originally from Maryland. Um, and so being back in the Washington, D.C. area has uh, been a joy for me. Um, great students at American University, great students at all of the places where I've interacted with. Um, so my line, and then I'll pass it on to Heath, is you will find your place at some great institution around the U.S. There's so many of us with different um, fields, vibes, towns, college towns, cities, that sort of thing. So um, we do hope that you'll take the time to explore the differences in each of our institutions. So, going to Heath. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. And I wanna um, thank GPS for having us. This is a real delight, and um, especially at a time of the year when we're busy reading applications, getting away from app, um, screens and spreadsheets can be really nice. Um, my name is Heath Einstein, and um, like, I'm guessing, all of the panelists on this stage, I did not major in <laughs> college admissions. Um, I'll give you just a thumbnail sketch. You can read my autobiography if you want the full picture. Uh, I went to George Washington University in Washington, D.C. as an undergraduate student. 
and um, continued uh, a little bit uh, west of there to Georgetown University, also in Washington, D.C., and I have a master's in public policy. Uh, I don't do public policy. Um, so a lot of us just sort of fall into this work, um, which I think is a really good lesson for you, that you don't have to know at 17 or 16 years old exactly what you want to do with the rest of your lives. Um, so after working for uh, a year uh, outside of the field of college admission, I got pulled right back in because I had been an undergraduate student employee and gave tours and did all that fun stuff. Um, so I worked at GW in admissions for a few years and then made the switch to the high school side and worked at independent schools in uh, suburban New York City um, and then in Dallas, actually at the Hockaday School, so I'm very familiar with the girls, with the girls school setting. Um, and for the last 10 years, I've been at uh, Texas Christian University, um, first as director of admission and now as dean. Uh, TCU is a medium-sized university. Uh, I think the unique position we hold in the higher ed ecosystem is that we're really the only school that plays major Division I athletics that's a medium size but has almost exclusively an undergraduate student body. And so you're going to get the attention that you'd see at a very small school in terms of faculty student engagement with the same sort of spirit you'd see at a very large institution. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Kerry Thompson, Vice President for Enrollment and Educational Services at Gettysburg College. Any guesses as to where that is? <laughs> You'd be right, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, the college is an outstanding uh, national residential liberal arts college of about 2,500 students, uh, Division Three. We can talk about all that stuff later, I suppose. Um, I represent a disproportionate number of those years that Amelia um, <laughs> mentioned earlier. Um, and we won't go into that any further. Um, but uh, I've been at Gettysburg for about six months um, and uh, have a, an interesting array, uh, array of responsibilities from admission and, and financial aid to institutional research um, and athletics. Uh, so a wide range of different uh, parts of the college I come in contact with. Prior to that, um, I was uh, dean uh, or vice president of enrollment and dean of admission at Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee. Not too far away. How about that? Go Lynx. Um, and was there for 11 years and prior to that uh, was at Center College in Danville, Kentucky where I was vice president there. Um, and prior to that, I uh, was uh, director of admission at Furman University, uh, which is my alma mater. Uh, I grew up in Atlanta and um, had a wonderful experience, undergraduate experience at Furman and was one of those guys that got hired out of the senior class thinking I'd go to law school a year or two later. And yet, here I am. Uh, so I stopped off at Vandy for grad school um, and um, I've had just been absolutely blessed uh, to be a part of uh, just a number of really wonderful, excellent um, uh, institutions uh, that uh, um, are worth your time to consider, all of them. Um, and uh, look forward to your questions and, and helping you move along this path. I, I think I represent the other disproportionate no, part of that you're not even volume. Close. Hi, y'all. I'm Sally Stone Richmond from uh, WNL, where I have been. This is my seventh year at uh, Washington and Lee, and uh, I'm a native of Virginia. Um, and my admission and financial aid sort of career story is one that's very much tied with the liberal arts, the uh, approach to higher education. I hate. Um, attended uh, Davidson, graduated from Davidson College, where I also worked twice, and in that experience had a very um, quintessential, transformative liberal arts college undergraduate experience. And just like has been mentioned, um, landed in admission, having um, deduced there were a lot of things I didn't like, but when I looked at my, um, the admission officers at, at Davidson where I was a volunteer and s seemed like a really f uh, interesting, fun job, powerful job as a, a recent college grad, thought same thing, I'll be there two years and I'm now, I guess, 23 years later. Um, I have worked at um, 
two, uh, at one other liberal arts institution besides Davidson, Occidental College in Los Angeles, so I've covered the coast. And I've also, like Keith, been a college guidance uh, counselor as well. And um, I think, number one, um, I love high school uh, age students. I really, really, in, I really enjoy working with high school age students. Um, I'm glad of that fact right now because my own child is a high school senior. Um, and I know nothing about college admission when I walk in, in the door of my home. Um, so I'm really glad I like high school students. Um, and we, uh, uh, educational um, organizations are great places to show up every day. Um, it is, they are energetic, whether that's uh, elementary, middle, secondary, or uh, college environment. People come to work excited about learning, excited about teaching, and thinking about um, the, all the incredible ways that we can continue to positively affect the future. And that's the privilege we as admission officers have, is the opportunity to have a small glimpse um, that you all as applicants are generous to share with us about the way you think about the future and your future and, and those contributions. So thank you for having us this evening. Hey folks, uh, good evening and a big shout out to the folks live streaming uh, also. Good to see you all, uh, or hopefully it's good for you to see us. Um, <laughs> I'm Tyler Peterson. I'm at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. We are a public urban research university of about 22,000 students. Uh, I am finishing my 20th year in enrollment management, uh, working at a variety of different institutions, both small public um, and larger or mid-sized uh, public. Um, how I got here, I really loved college, and while I was there, I had great mentors in areas and departments of student affairs and student government association, and it was hey Tyler, maybe you should try something in, in admissions. And so 20 years later, here's, this is what I'm doing. Uh, love the interaction that we have with students, love the ability to um, just share our expertise for where we work and also this process. So thank you for having us tonight. Thank you everybody. Okay, so the world of college admissions has changed a lot. The landscape is very different than from when he, many of your parents have, have, were looking at colleges and going to college. Um, but what hasn't changed? What is still the same despite all, all that has changed? I'll say one thing that has not changed are the people who care about you as applicants, as students who are looking at our institutions, um, trying to discover what our institution may, may, what may make our institution unique. Um, there are people behind the desk who are actually reading your application, so it's not a machine. So that hasn't changed. Um, and I think that you'll find that uh, we do care about the students who take the time to apply to our institutions, um, and that we are here to help and support you through the process answer any questions that you may have, um, because so much has changed um, over the last several years. Um, and we're also here for your parents as well. Um, so this is your process, but you know, parents, we're also welcome, um, we'll welcome your questions too. I'll just add and say we're still here, and you're still here, and uh, our campuses still have grass and buildings, and residence halls, and social life, and academics, and learning, and teaching, and students getting in trouble. Uh, so all of the things that uh, we, we have known uh, still exist. It looks a little different. You look a little different right now with the mask on. I look a little different. Um, but at the core, um, this process and where we are and who we are is, 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 still, um, is still the same. So, COVID, it's still happening. Um, how has that changed your recruitment practices? And how would you encourage students and parents to engage with colleges right now, both from a virtual engagement standpoint and also with on-campus visits? How has it changed? Uh, it has... Um, 
for all that has stayed the same, and I would, I would submit most of it has stayed the same, the outreach has changed dramatically. The way we do it, the methodology, the employment of, of digital platforms um, and the like. Uh, so we're still all experimenting and trying to find the right way, the right mix, the right... Um, um, we, we all desperately want to cut through the clutter of life and get our message through and to uh, develop a relationship with you um, uh, individually. So that's, that's the goal. Um, the methods have had to change some. Um, in terms of interacting with us, um, turn your cameras on. That, you're supposed to laugh. <laughs> the, these people up here know exactly what I'm talking about. So when we, when we uh, have a Zoom or when we're uh, meeting uh, uh, with you at your school or, or all those sorts of things, the interaction's important. That's the way we get to know you. So we need to see your face. We need to see your smile. Uh, we need to see your questions. Um, this is hard without, um, without really being face to face. So um, interact. Um, and we're all zoomed out. All of us up here get it. Trust me. Um, we have attended, um, oh gosh, I don't know, eight hours a day on Zoom meetings of one description or another for the last two years, um, or for much of the last two years. So, so we all get that. But to the extent that you can interact with us, uh, or, or with the admission staff member um, that, uh, that you're meeting with. That's the goal. We're, we're really trying to get to know you. One suggestion or, or observation I have about what um, has changed is that we, as, as Carrie said so well, we have had to think about how to expand the mediums through which we are engaging with you. And I'm sorry for those of us that have built TikTok page, college TikTok pages. Bad, bad idea. Um, um, but one of, the re one of the realities of that is that you as students and families can access so much more information about us virtually um, whether it's the you visit tours or the opportunity to, to engage in a, in a Zoom conversation with a, with a current student, um, at whenever you wish, whenever it suits you, whatever grade it suits you. But one of the things I would suggest, and I think it goes to the second part of your question, Amelia, is the work of you thinking about and considering what matters to you, the introspective work that will make a really successful and satisfying college search process should not be skipped. Just because you can get to these things and learn about individual schools, that's really part two of this process. The first part should be you thinking about, well, what matters to you? How do you learn best? What is the environment that you want? What are the non-negotiables for you as a student that you have to have on a campus or you absolutely cannot have on a campus? Those things that are totally unrelated to an individual institution need to still be something that you're prioritizing, especially in, in um, the fall and, and winter of your junior years. Um, I think, you know, building on some of the themes that have already been explored a little bit, um, when, when the pandemic first struck, what a lot of admission offices did was said, okay, how do we take exactly what we're doing now and put it onto a screen? And what we figured out pretty quickly is that's not going to work. But we were able to innovate and develop some programming that, frankly, we hadn't thought about, but we probably should have been thinking about for a long time. Because what um, the current generation of student is looking for, what you all are looking for, is quite a bit different from what students 10 or 15 years were looking for. And the cookie cutter approach that colleges took wasn't especially successful. Gen Z students require a little bit more of a boutique experience, and now you can actually get that. You can go online and see all of the myriad platforms that are offered and just pick and choose what, what matters to you, um, sort of what, what Sally was talking about. So, um, you know, not that the pandemic is a good thing, surely it's not, but 
um, it has forced our hands and, and in, uh, in a way has provided, I think, a much better service for you. Um, the other thing in terms of like how do you actually interact with us, and, and one of the things we, we haven't talked about is the in-person piece. Some colleges are doing it. We've been in person since June of uh, 20. Right. What year are we in? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was just 10 years ago. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Um, so we were offline for just a, a, a bit, um, and, and we've been in person since then. Now we've, of course, we enacted safety protocols like, like, like you all have done as well. But um, so there are some schools that are very much offering you an in person experience, and you can take advantage of that if you choose to and if you feel comfortable doing that. Um, but everybody's got something uh, uh, online as well. Um, don't feel, though, as, as when we say how should students engage, you should engage to the extent that you are comfortable and um, in a way that will help you understand yourself and eventually understand the college, but not in order to appease the school, not to check some boxes because you think we want to hear from you. Do what's going to matter to you so that you can become fully in invested. Just to comment on that, though, um, because there are some of us who may use demonstrated interest in our process. So um, American University is, is one of those institutions. Over the course of the next several years, you'll hear a whole bunch of terms thrown out at you. And one of those terms is just demonstrated interest. And what that means is that colleges want to know those students who are interested in them um, and may use that as part of their process. We like to say that they are meaningful interactions, and so it doesn't mean that you have to email your admissions rep every single month to check in, um, but maybe you, are ha you do have the ability to come visit us in DC, or when we're traveling, you have an opportunity to meet with one of our staff members on the road. Or if you can't get out, do one of our virtual events, or um, send that email to that counselor just to say that you are interested um, in some meaningful way. Um, but there are, as has been said, several ways for you to just interact and engage um, with the college reps. And then just very lastly, from a very practical standpoint, we do welcome visitors, and I would just add that there are differences across the U.S. as how we've handled this pandemic. D.C. is probably one of the more strict places um, in terms of protocols, and so I think just from a practical standpoint, just do your research, plan ahead, um, and looking at what the college or the university may require when you do come to visit their campus over the next couple of years. So this week in college class, the juniors have talked about um, standardized testing and how that has shifted as of late um, with a, a larger movement to test optional admissions. Can you all address how that has, how, how standardized tests are used in your processes and how you're seeing that change because of the lack of opportunities for some students to test? I'll start. Um, so, yeah, I would say uh, uh, when you think about standardized test, um, think of it as, as one piece of, of a larger recipe um, and it may be an important ingredient to that recipe um, but it's not the only thing that goes into to, to that. Um, you know standardized tests have uh, been used for so long uh, that in many ways it's taken and this may not be true of every panelist here but it has taken a global pandemic for many universities, and I'll just speak for mine, to say, wait, we, we, we can't do this right now. We can't require people to go take this test. It's also opened up doors for a lot of universities to have the conversations of, well, wait a second. We did this for the class of 2021 because they couldn't take it. And um, maybe there's a way that, that we can continue to do that. We know that test scores have been um, barriers for a lot of students in terms of college access. And so, um, you know, I think the future of test optional admissions in higher education is, is still yet to be determined. Um, a lot of institutions can make that decision. 
um, and and go simply to their president or their board of trustees and get get approval. Um, for some states, it may be that it has to go to the state legislature. It may be that it has to get voted on and passed and approved by numerous boards uh, before it uh, before it happens. So I think what I would say about a, a test score is that what we've seen and what a lot of schools have seen is that um, for schools that have uh, made an SAT or an SAT optional, about a third uh, of an applicant pool is not submitting their test score, which that means there are still people that feel really good about their test score and they're submitting it. Um, I would, I would offer the advice and then I'll pass it to the rest of my colleagues that when you think about a standardized score and you think about applying to college and if that is an option for you next year to either submit it or not, if you think that test score accurately reflects who you are and your academic ability, uh, then by all means submit it. If you're applying to a school that doesn't require it um, and you feel like that doesn't accurately reflect who you are, then don't submit it. Uh, you have a choice uh, in that process for a school that, that offers that. Um, I know there's a lot of opinions on this, so I'll, I'll pass it on. So like UAB and a lot of other places, we at TCU went test optional, um, made the announcement in April of 2020. Um, and, and we announced that we were going to be doing it for three years because at that point we didn't know what was going to come and we didn't feel like just doing it for a year would give us enough data to know if this is something we ought to be doing in a permanent way. Um, test scores, the results of SAT, ACT and other standardized exams um, have some value. Okay. They tell us um, who tests, who can take that test well. And they say a lot about your um, family income level and maybe parental educational achievement. Um, but in isolation, the test scores aren't always the best predictors of success in college, certainly beyond what we can learn by looking at a, at a school transcript. There may be some value to some students um, to, have, to have high test scores. And unfortunately, what's happened in college admissions is that um, at many, not all, but at many institutions, um, it, it became a barrier such that if you didn't have a certain, didn't meet a certain threshold, your, your chances of admission were pretty slim. So this has sort of brought along um, or um, suggests that we may be in a period of significant inflection. Now, also, there were lots of schools that were test optional before the pandemic started. Lots of wonderful schools, um, and, and they're all saying, hey, we've been doing this all along, and we've been graduating amazing classes all along. Um, where, where have the rest of you been? Um, and the rest of us are, are just now catching up. So I think we're in a position like a lot of other schools where we are going to go where the data tell us. We're going to take these next couple of years and evaluate how the students who have come in under the um, test optional policy and withholding their test scores and seeing how they fare. The schools that have done this for a long time, they've already done the research on this and the, and the result is those kids do just fine. So I'm, I have very little doubt that when it comes time for our faculty to make a decision that, that we'll, be, um, we'll be in the, the test optional camp. Now the question I think that naturally arises is, okay, but when you say optional, do you really mean optional? And it's a fair question. Um, and what I would suggest is you ask colleges for, for data on that. Um, we're pretty open about, about it. In year one, um, the rate of admission was, was ver fairly similar between those whose scores were used and those whose scores weren't. My, my other piece of advice would be take the test. Don't, don't avoid it. Take it and see how you do and then make a decision and work very closely with your wonderful college counseling staff. They have years of experience, maybe not 160 years, but um, 
but they have years of experience in this as well, and let, let them advise you on, uh, on the best course of action to take. I'll just say, TCU, we have what we call a do no harm policy, which is you submit the score, and we will literally run you through our process twice, one w once with the score and once without, and whichever one makes you look better, that's what we're gonna use. And you say, well, surely you don't do that. Why wouldn't we do that? <laughs> Right? Don't, we want to paint you in the best light possible. We want you to come to TCU. We want you to be excited about the place. We want to enroll you. So, um, but you need to check with each school. You're going to find, we say that a lot, right? It depends. It depends on the school. This is another one. You want to check with every school you're interested in. What does your policy actually state? How do you apply it? Um, and what are the data telling you, telling us? I've had a, a, a unique professional experience that in the last year I've worked for a school that just became test optional at Rhodes, we became test optional in March 2020, um, when it became blindingly clear that students weren't going to have the opportunity to take the test. Gettysburg is one of those colleges that would say, we've been doing this for 20 years, this isn't that hard. Um, and it's not. Um, we figured out very quickly at Rhodes, took, a, took a, an adjustment, um, but we figured out how to do it. Uh, I think the genie is out of the bottle. Uh, I think it's going to be very difficult to put back in, but you should check with each individual school. Um, but also be aware, and I agree with everything both of my colleagues have said, also be aware that in the absence of a test score, what are we left with? We're left with the courses that you've chosen to take in high school. We're left with the performance, um, your performance in those courses. We're left with your college essay, we're left with your extracurricular activities, and we're left with your recommendations. Those are the other components, that, those, the, those are the other pieces of the recipe. And uh, so without the test score, there's going to be more scrutiny. That's, that sounds like a, such a harsh word. There's going to be more attention paid to those other components, right? Um, so understand the whole process. Uh, and uh, check with each college as to what their practice is. Uh, but I would ag certainly agree with Heath. Don't not take the test. Uh, that's going to foreclose some options to you. Um, and um, that's not in your best interest. So again, this week in college class, we did talk about standardized testing. For the parents in the room, um, we are very, very pleased at GPS to be able to offer school day testing. And so we will be giving each girl an opportunity to take the ACT and the SAT in March. Um, and so as, um, as we begin having our family meetings, we'll ask you to, to look at other standardized test dates that are on Saturdays from now and through the summer. But, but do know that each girl will be given the opportunity to take both the SAT and ACT. Sure. Thanks, everybody. Um, so speaking of the rigor of the curriculum and what that transcript looks like when you're reviewing it, um, GPS specifically, when you're evaluating a student, our girls like to say, do they know how hard GPS is? So how do you learn about a school and learn about the rigor of the school and consider that in the context of the review of the application? So the answer is, um, we it's our responsibility to learn how rigorous every school is that, ha that a student applies to um, our institutions about. And there are a number of different ways to do that. The reason that matters is because what we know, unlike a test score, as he said, test score in and of itself doesn't pre uh, predict the best success in college. We do know that your high school experience, the curriculum you've chosen to take, and the grades you've earned are the best predictors of your success at our institutions. But every high school is different. And so we don't move, walk into an application evaluation process, open a student's application, and say, well, this year we're looking for a 3.99 unweighted with 12 APs. It's just not fair. That's not, the, that's not the way you can read an application. It's when we talked about the thing not changing, the humans behind this, reading applications is um, an incredibly time intensive process. And the primary reason it is, is because we do take the time to understand the school's 
background. So when a students, a students are applying, we have admission officers who may have traveled to that area, may know the communities, may have visited the schools, have, the, have had the live in-person experience of visiting a number of schools. But even if they haven't, your counselors will send us a, tr a profile. And that profile will give us a lot of great information about this community so that even a, a totally novice um, new reader will have the ability to say, all right, well, here's the program. Here's what's required to be to be invited to take a, an AP course. Here's the number you may take. Here is some of the unique programs that you can that you can take. That's the to us. That's the most fun part of putting a class together is that we're thinking about uh, inviting students from across the country and the world who are going to have so many different school experiences and life experiences that they're going to bring, but it's our responsibility to understand that you um, can do um, that work. And we will have in that uh, not just the, the quantitative information, how your grades, how you've performed, but the context, right? the recommendations from teachers. Those, think of those as, I think of those as like faculty, our faculty proxies. They're those teachers saying, this is what I've enjoyed about having the student in class. These are the things that they bring to the classroom environment. And then it's incumbent upon you as the applicant to sort of give evidence to that intellectual acuity through your writing through your engagement with the institution, if they offer interviews, your ability to, to really exemplify not just the, the paper performance, but the real story behind the, the level of that rigor, the um, and enthusiasm for learning that you, that you bring. So it's our responsibility as admission readers to understand and appreciate the information we can get. We have other ways of, of, of learning that information. Um, by the way, we don't, that doesn't include trying to identify your social media channels and learn about you through that. It is through real, uh, the sources of information that you give us and that the school will, will share with us as well. Is it just a coincidence that behind us are, are brag facts about GPS? <laughs> Uh, that 100% of the girls are accepted to colleges and universities, greater self-confidence, uh, great STEM knowledge. So uh, also your institution, GPS, does a great job of, of communicating uh, uh, the, the, the rigor and the opportunities that are here. Uh, Sally covered a lot there, so we're going to dig into it a little bit more. Um, so. You all are really involved students. You're taking challenging classes, honors and AP courses, many of you. Um, you're the captains of your teams. You're the leaders in the theater. Um, so they're going to want to know what's going to distinguish their applications as you read thousands and thousands of applications. It's an easy one. Come on. I, I always like to um, think about the things that you can control with the application by the time you're getting to completing the application itself. Um, so the things you can control, how you describe all of those activities and extracurricular um, events and leadership and whatever it is that you do outside of the classroom. Um, this is an opportunity for you to brag about your accomplishments, um, to describe those things that you're most proud of, um, how you've spent your time. Um, it's, you know, I'm sure all of us could probably relay a story about how we didn't learn about somebody being you know, president of the student body, but through a letter of recommendation um, because the student did not tell us that information. Um, so how you describe what it is you're involved in is important. The essay is very important. I think all of us enjoy reading. Um, the essay is an opportunity for us to get to know who you are as a student. Um, the application essay topics are pretty much out there. A lot of us are on the common application um, or the coalition application. Those essay topics are available. You can start practice that writing in your summertime when it's less hectic, less busy, um, so that you have that um, by the time the common app opens August 1 of your senior year. And then the last thing that you can control are who you ask for your letters of recommendation. Um, they don't necessarily have to be teachers that you earned an A, but perhaps you worked very closely with a particular teacher on a course because it was a material that you, was, you found very challenging, um, but you asked questions. The teacher can talk about the ways that you uh, raised your hand in the classroom, how you interacted in the classroom itself. 
Um, so think about those aspects of the application and how you can distinguish yourself. Spending a little bit more time just talking about the essay itself. Um, we know that you're all 17, 18 by the time you apply to our institutions. Your experiences probably have been limited. Uh, most 17, 18 year olds have very similar experiences. Um, but how can you make it distinctly your experience? How can you make it distinctly you? Um, how can you write about a specific topic or subject matter that is, I like to say, one moment in time, one particular theme, um, that makes you stand out amongst all the other students who are applying to the institution? So even if it's an essay about, and we've, we've seen several essays about getting that winning score, or going on a trip abroad, or doing something in the summer, what was special about that from your perspective? What was special about making that um, uh, winning goal or, or going to that trip abroad um, from your distinct perspective? So just think about that a little bit as you're um, getting ready to complete your applications when you become a senior in high school. You'll see tomorrow when we do our case studies, you'll, um, the, the essays are always a, a point of great debate and conversation. So we'll have some of your own opinions to glean from those yet to, tomorrow as well. One, one of the real advantages of having gone here is that you know your teachers very well and they know you. Uh, they've been watching you, whether you realize it or not, and these are the people that are gonna write those letters of recommendation. Um, not every high school student in America has the opportunity to be understood as well. And um, so think, think about that a bit. Think about who you connect with, um, who connects with you. Um, um, don't ask that person to write the letter of recommendation the day before it's due, <laughs> and maybe even take them a box of cookies. Um, but, but that is a real advantage of this experience. Somebody who knows you in depth, who knows what you can bring to the classroom, who understands how you interact with others. All of those things, those are all things people at GPS are watching right now. Um, so number one, be aware of that. Number two, be thoughtful about that in terms of, of that recommendation. It's not just, oh, I gotta find three people. It's, let me take some time and think about that a little bit. And your college counselors can be really helpful in helping you think through that as well. When, when I think about the question, what is it that we're looking for, I think what you'd find almost every selective and certainly the, the, the most selective or what's come into vogue, the most rejective colleges would tell you is that we have more qualified applicants than we actually have space for. And that is an unfortunate reality. Not every student who could do the work is going to be admitted. Um, what we're looking for are what I describe as high impact individuals. Um, people who are going to come into our community and make the place better than the way they found it. That doesn't mean that every student has to be student body president or captain of the field hockey team by any stretch. Um, you don't have to be the most outgoing person to be a high impact person. But what we don't want are the kids who've gone to school um, and come home and played PlayStation for the rest of the day. Um, although we do have an intramural Xbox championship at TCU, so. Um, but we want, we want individuals of impact. And understand, as Carrie alluded to, with the, the, um, the real advantage of going to a place like GPS, in addition to the fact that you get to have people like us come and talk to you, and not every high school student has that, and we get to know you and know your schools really well, not every student has that. You can trust that even if you don't get into the schools you really wanted to go to, and you have to um, go somewhere that might have been your third choice, which is still probably one of the top 20 colleges in America, 
that you're prepared to excel once you get there. The advantage of going here is the preparation it has provided you no matter where you end up going. Can I rip off of something that he said? Um, first of all, thank you for making that point that our process is about um, helping to shape a community, but we know that what this experience has been is not about college admissions, it's college preparation. And, and um, knowing and feeling very good and confident about your ability to be successful wherever you choose to enroll. But I wanted to get to, the, to your point about the, um, what we're looking for. And one of the real, um, I think, advantages for the, um, well, how COVID has changed the way college admission works is that we have gotten a little off of our high horse when it comes to having this idea of, of some sort of perfect resume. And um, because, again, just like with testing, and Tyler talked about, well, you just couldn't access tests, therefore it is an impediment. The ability to be involved in a sort of stereotypical U.S. high school college-bound way changed instantly. And um, we really began to see um, and it, uh, differences in um, communities, and we began to understand, and students began to, had to, to communicate with us really some of the changes in their own life and responsibilities. So um, we saw and, and, were, and are happy to welcome and appreciate understanding when students were working. Um, sometimes that was, some, we've seen that become much more, at WNL we've seen that become much more common in a student's application because in some communities, that was the only way you got to get out <laughs> was you were, you were, you were able to, um, to, to go work. You weren't playing sports, you weren't, you know, it just depends on a, on a community. But it forced us to not um, fall into some sometimes lazy habits, quite frankly, of just sort of looking and thinking about, okay, well, what are the total number of things or number of hours that someone has done 15 different activities? And it's, and it's um, forced us to sort of do exactly what you all do, which is identify and prioritize your time based on what you value. And for us to appreciate that more forcefully, I think is the best way to put that, or more um, publicly. So the pandemic, especially with online learning at many institutions, have forced us to really, really confront that, um, what is the return on this investment question? Um, so many of our families are middle class and often the financial aid process feels like it's squeezing the middle class. So can you talk about um, the value proposition of going to college and what that looks like right now in the age of COVID? You know, going back to um, what Tyler said in terms of what hasn't changed, um, you know, the, there are still buildings, classes, you're interacting with professors, you're interacting with other students. And so I think um, certainly the value of education, um, of higher education, A, the knowledge that you're going to gain um, by interacting with world-class faculty members at each of our institutions. Um, the small moments that you have with your peers in the residence halls. Um, and so those interactions are going to be valuable. And those are people who you're probably going to know for the rest of your life. Um, those things just don't go away. And even, even though, for example, we've been um, kind of at American both virtual, then we've been in the residence halls, students are still wearing masks, but they're still engaging in clubs and organizations, they're still getting out even through Zoom meetings sometimes, uh, making those connections, I think that that is important in, in higher ed. And just generally speaking from a very broad perspective, um, the value of higher education and just providing opportunities for students once they graduate in their career, in their life, and becoming good citizens in the U.S. and all of those things, um, I think are still very much important and still very much in place um, at our institutions. I would also just add, um, working at a private institution, that you will see a sticker price that may provide some level of sticker shock, um, but that there is aid available for students, whether it's through merit scholarships, 
Um, so based on your academic achievements and those things that you've done outside of the classroom, um, whether you may need need-based financial aid as well, um, to talk to the institutions to see what op options and possibilities may be available to you as a student based on your family's finances. Um, and certainly, yes, there is, there could very well be the case that some of you may have to take out some loans, um, but just think about the investment in the institution and the time that you're spending getting this degree um, and what you can do beyond just the, um, don't think just so, solely about the loans being just um, a burdensome. Um, I would say certainly don't go into extreme levels of debt. There is some manageable levels, um, but it is debt that is, I think, manageable that will provide that level of return of investment once a student graduates from our institutions. So for, um, I think, generations, it was sort of accepted that um, the step after secondary school was you, you go to college, you earn a degree, and that was a, a pretty useful tool um, for social mobility in this country. And even before the pandemic, we started to see this sort of chiseling away at the trust in the value of higher education. And I would argue it's more valuable now than ever before for a, for a lot of reasons. Um, but in a real, real practical way, not the least of which is that what once was you needed a bachelor's degree to sort of get ahead, now it's you need a bachelor's degree just to sort of stay level. Um, so I don't think there's any question that, that students need to, to um, to go to school beyond high school. And you're going to see, you'll, you'll, you'll read in, in media all sorts of examples to the contrary, but those are sort of few and far between. Um, but then how do you make it work financially is a real question, a real dilemma for a lot of families. Um, the reality is there are a lot of great colleges that are, that are affordable. And because we tend to focus on a very small set of schools and our, our attention collectively is focused uh, disproportionately to this number of schools that everybody's trying to get to but will actually educate a tiny percentage of our population, we forego considering the, the literally thousands and probably many dozens that you'd be comfortable with um, that are affordable and you could get a, get a nice scholarship too if the sticker price was, was more than you're, you're comfortable with. We did a market study a couple years ago um, in an area of the country where we felt like we had an opportunity for a little bit greater market penetration. And um, what we learned from, from that is that 90% of the people we surveyed expected to get a scholarship, uh, which we found rather, uh, rather astonishing. But I think families go into this process now just assuming they're not going to be paying the, the full sticker price. Um, and you can find schools that aren't going to charge you as much as that, that sticker price. If cost is going to be a factor for you as it is for most families, the vast majority of families, then where you ought to consider, in addition to um, maybe schools that um, where the profile of the average admitted student is a little bit higher than where your um, statistics currently sit, you got to also look at the schools where your grades, test scores if you have them, and other um, credentials exceed the profile of the average admitted student, because that's where you're going to get the scholarship offers. Well, I was going to say something practical as well. How about that? Are you say something? Maybe so. <laughs> All of us on our websites, oh, how about that? Yeah. All of us on our websites have something called a net price calculator. Uh, and that is, it's required. It's a federal requirement. We all have them. Um, some of them are better than others. Uh, so what I'm about to suggest to you is something I would suggest you do on three or four different net price calculators just to get a sense of what uh, the resources are for your family at that school. Now, the better information that you plug in, the better information you will 
get out, but you could go home and do that tonight at any college in, uh, any college, uh, in America's website. So there are some tools for you to really help get a sense of what, you're, what you should anticipate. Uh, they're not perfect, they're not meant to be perfect, uh, but you can, you can get a pretty good sense at a lot of colleges and universities using their net price calculator. The other thing that's changed in the last few years is that people apply and submit for need-based aid much earlier in the process. So you'll know in, in the, early in the senior year, or could know early in the senior year, uh, about uh, uh, what need-based aid might look like, what your eligibility would be, what your expected family contribution would be. That's a technical term in the field. You'll figure that out. We'll talk about that if you've got questions, but uh, that's, that's the index colleges use to figure out how much a family can afford. The other thing is less practical, um, but I would advise families to look at one's education as a long-term investment. The job you have six months out of college is not the job you're going to have six years out of college, and not the job you're going to have 16 years out of college. Most of the stats today suggest the average college graduate will have 10 to 15 different jobs by the time they retire, um, many of them in fields that we can't even imagine right now. Uh, so there are all kinds of opportunities. The, the, why you're here at Girls Prep and why you go to one of our colleges or colleges like ours is to get a lifelong education, an education that will serve you for life, that will teach you to think critically, it will teach you how to speak well, how to, how to, how to read well, how to, how to take vast amounts of information and synthesize them into something useful and perhaps even new. That's what this is all about. We can all, I, I bet every one of us have, uh, could have a stat on our website that say 98% of our graduates uh, are either employed or in graduate school in the first six months out of college. Okay, well once every, everybody has 98%, <laughs> that, that ceases to be a reason to choose one over another. Uh, you need to look at career services and all those sorts of things. But, um, but the fit the, the, of, of the student and the experience that that student has in the classroom uh, and beyond is really going to make the difference for the long term. But isn't that so true, though? I, it's a great comment because how often do you speak to somebody, a parent or, uh, or a student, who says, my goal is to walk out of here without any debt, okay? Which is a, fa a fair goal, a reasonable goal. Um, the same family might take out, you know, a $30,000 loan to pay for a car that depreciates the minute it goes off the lot. Correct. Whereas the investment you're making in college just goes up. So it's sort of a very interesting, it is. Um, you know, the mental gymnastics right. uh, going on there. Most of, uh, I would also say most of the horror stories you hear about student debt are on the graduate school level, professional school level, for-profit school level. Um, uh, there are reasonable ways to take out educational debt that do not involve hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. In fact, I think all of us would say, if you are financing the total cost of education with debt, you don't, do don't do that. See a financial advisor, and none of us are. So we've got fantastic parents and guardians in the room tonight. Um, what advice do you have for our parents as they support their daughters through this ed college admissions journey. I guess I'm speaking to myself. Hey, mom. I say, <laughs> um, no. Actually, what I would um, urge you to do is to have a conversation or discern how um, how you all feel comfortable making decisions and how you, um, the students, feel that you make decisions. What I mean by that is that. Um, that's going to, the way you feel safe and comfortable moving through big decisions, I mean, what, what is, is this if not a very big decision? And so learning that about yourself, do you tend to be more intuitive? Do you, do, are you logical? Are you sensory? In other words, you can't imagine um, even thinking about where you'll apply until you have, you've spent hours on each campus. Do you need to buy the guidebook and, and, and look at every data 
point about the institution? Are you going to have to make a pro-con list? Think about other times and, and, and how you feel comfortable making decisions because that will, um, in my experience, learning that and appreciating that will then mean that when you're having your, whatever way you as a family want to talk about colleges once a week at the dinner table, whatever that is, knowing that you understand the way in which um, your daughter is looking at this and then thinking about it will be very instructive as you think about the, especially the harder conversations about, about this process. That you're not trying to fit a square peg in a round hole when it comes to making, if you, and if you see, if you make decisions the same way, great. If you don't, fine. Um, but every, every person, every young people, person I interact with, they go about this slightly differently. And they will come to the place of feeling good about that decision when they, it's been a, a means through which they've done it that, that made sense to them. Um, you know, we've all heard the stories about folks getting to a campus and the, it's been a place that um, you thought you really liked and then you don't even want to get out of the car. Like, well, how in the world, like, I, as a parent, what? We just went all this way and you told us and you don't want to get, no, I don't, well, can you explain why? Well, maybe not, depending on, on, on how you make decisions. You may not, it, it is gonna, it could be intuitive. Um, and knowing that about each other um, as you m embark on this together will allow you to move through those times and, of course, like anything in life, keeping a sense of humor is critically important. Yeah, there, there's a terrific opportunity to drive each other crazy uh, through this. So uh, resist that urge. Uh, I literally had that experience with my oldest daughter in 10th grade driving up on the campus of Colorado College. I said, Sarah, we're here. And we had gone through a lot to get there. And she took out her earbuds, looked outside. I don't think I'd like it. <laughs> God's honest truth, no exaggeration. <laughs> Wouldn't get out of the car. So uh, all of you are different. And resist the urge even to compare uh, your experience with your daughter or, or with your parent, with anybody else, because it's all gonna be unique to you. The, the one, um, and all of mine have graduated, um, that goes back to the disproportionate number of years, um, um, but all of mine are beyond college at this point. Uh, one piece of advice just on a personal level, and I have many actually, but I'll just limit it to one. Um, taking it back to the financial discussion we had just a minute ago. It's really important, I think, for the whole family to appreciate up front, early in the process, what are the financial realities of what we're dealing with. Uh, all of us can tell stories uh, about a young person who has applied and been admitted and fallen in love with our campus, and mom or dad says right at the end, sorry, we can't afford that, you can't go. That's a pretty tough conversation uh, at that stage, late in the senior year. That should have been a conversation that happened early in the senior year. So um, that's a dinner table conversation. Every family's different. Every family has different values, different priorities, different circumstances. Um, you, there may be five kids in the family and you gotta figure this out for all five. I, who knows? Um, but that's, that's an important conversation to have early on. My advice would be rooted in uh, when I have seen um, situations that have not ended well, uh, where a student has come to our institution uh, and it's primarily been a parent, family member, loved one who has been the driving force behind that. Um, and you could see the whole time in that student's face that this is not where they wanted to be. Um, that this is where a parent, guardian, loved one thought, you know, this is where you should be. Um, and, uh, you know, unless your goal is to transfer, and that's certainly possible, there may be a goal to start at a community college and transfer. There may be a goal to start somewhere else and then transfer to a, a school that has a nursing program through a 3-2 uh, agreement, wh whatever it may be. But if that's not your goal, we, we want it to be right only once. And I think it's right once 
when um, family members realize that, that they're not going to college, that it's their daughter. I think you get it right once uh, when um, you realize that where your son or daughter in this case goes to school isn't for you just a point of pride and a bumper sticker you get to put on your car. Um, that it's truly about where can my daughter go, that she's going to be happy and be successful, and that she's going to be cared for, and that she's going to have opportunities. And when I've seen that, that's the really awesome thing about our job, uh, is when we know that that student finds that, and it's because it's the right thing for them, not necessarily the right thing for their parent or family member. So I think my advice dovetails really nicely, Tyler, on what you just said. Um, the especially about the bumper sticker. Um, the NYU College of Nursing did a study about six, seven years ago now, and they looked at students, um, they did a, a, a quantitative and qualitative study, comprehensive, that looked at students in 11th grade at, um, at independent schools in New York, okay? So similar, similar community, not, the, not exactly the same, but similar. And what they found was rather astounding. The levels of anxiety, chronic depression, um, the, the number of hours of homework that the students were doing at night. I'm sure girls, you have no idea what that's about. Um, and the girls did more homework than the boys. Um, and, and largely what they pinned it to was the pressure that the students felt from their parents. And to, to some measure, the pressure that we in the college admission process who were involved put on high school students. So we bear, we the adults in the room, bear collectively some uh, responsibility here. Um, my point being that we can offer all sorts of practical advice and it's all, it's all good, everything that was said here was right. But at the end of the day, what it boils down to is parents have one job, and that's to love your children. That's it. And they need to hear you say that repeatedly. And you can't wait until the process is over because then what will be internalized is my value as a child was based on this process. What you need to say is we love you no matter what happens, and we know you're going to be successful no matter what happens. The rest of it doesn't really matter all that much. I don't know that I could add after, yeah. after hearing that. Um, you know, I, I would agree. Um, there are so many places, we've talked about it, we've hinted around it. Um, there are so many different places and opportunities for students out there. Um, and just allowing your daughters to, to find what's going to be the best match for them in the end, I think is, is ultimately what your responsibility is, beyond loving them, of course. Um, and allowing them to discover some of these things on their own, learn who they are, um, start that um, identity kind of process um, and identifying who they are as an individual, who they want to be as they move into adulthood, um, and providing that flexibility and space. Um, I, I personally don't have any children, but my niece went through this process last year and going through it with my sister. And my sister, college educated, had no idea what was going on. Um, I tried to provide advice and, and help and guidance, and I think I was stressing her out more than I was stressing out my niece. <laughs> Um, so I think that your daughters will figure it out. They're smart women. Um, women typically, as kind of Heath alluded to, we're more often than not a little bit ahead of the game when it comes to these sorts of things. Um, and so providing that just su support, those guardrails for your, um, for your student as they figure this process out. And in the end, they will end up where they are meant to be. Um, and if not, there's always that transfer process and we can help them um, through that transfer process as well. Thank you, everybody. At this time, I'd like to open uh, it up to questions. If you could um, either speak very loudly with your question, or I'm going to have uh, Ms. Landreth 
um, or Miss Lester, if she's around, I don't know, um, run around with a microphone and have you ask your question to the mic. If you would, um, just carefully consider your question as it relates to maybe the good of the group and leave very specific institutional questions to um, maybe a separate conversation. So I'm going to pass my mic off and I want us all to be good and brave and I've got great teachers in the audience too, so if y'all have questions, please ask as well. So obviously our girls come from an advantage being in a private school and part of what you all talked about was standing out in your applications. I wonder how hard it is for an advantaged child to stand out. If, I guess what I'm seeing is a kid who comes from adversity would have maybe the opportunity to stand out more or what do they do if you have all these APs, all these classes, all this parental support, all this money behind you. It seems like what you would do is minimized. Uh, is there anything that makes you stand out more or do you think that it minimizes those children in some way? I'll take a stab at this one. Um, Given what I understand about demographics and college finance and the pressures on um, enrollment, you might have seen a, a Washington Post article this morning. Uh, undergraduate enrollment fell by, what, two and a half, three percent this past year, uh, or first year enrollment, rather, uh, on top of two and a half, three percent the previous year. It's never been a better time to have privilege in college admission. Um, uh, colleges are going to be embracing of students who are uh, talented and, and uh, have resources and um, uh, want to come and be a part of their community. That has um, always been true. I think it, if, if anything, it's even more true. I think what's changed is that colleges have um, wisely um, uh, taken time to um, to consider uh, students who are coming from backgrounds that have been less represented in college in the past. So there may be somewhat of an increase uh, in different colleges, depending on how important they see that task being. Um, but from your perspective, I wouldn't worry about it. Um, um, so I'll leave it there. Yeah, I, I think that I think that's exactly right. Um, and your your question is actually quite timely because I've heard more conversation in our professional circles um, in recent weeks than ever before about this, about the idea that it seems like we're asking students to tell us a sob story, um, and we're not. Um, we're not trying to um, uh, prey on the the trauma that that young people have experienced. Um, the reality is that colleges are businesses that um, rely on, it, in most cases, revenue um, tuition, in the form of tuition dollars. And um, folks who, can, who have the privilege to, to pay the whole freight are at a massive advantage because colleges want, need that money so that we can afford to create a more socioeconomically diverse community overall. So, um, so I would look at it, I would look at it like that. I don't think, um, there are lots of ways to stand out. Um, adversity, overcoming adversity, adversity is just one of them. There's a great line from um, uh, Paul Tuff's book, um, the college, what's, what's, what's the title of it? You know, it just came out a couple years ago. Um, <laughs> Paul Tuff, great journal, um, journalist, and he wrote this fantastic book that uh, the title alludes me at the moment. And he, he quotes one of our colleagues um, as saying, and I'm paraphrasing here, um, it's not about um, not being able to admit the students we really wish we could. Um, what colleges don't tell you is we, we end up admitting students we wish we didn't have to. 
Um, that's, that's the reality. There are a lot of students we need to admit in order to be able to afford um, everybody else. And, 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 that sounds and, really harsh, but that's true. Yeah, and, and, and let's also keep in mind, there, there are a small handful of colleges and universities in the country that have a 3% admit rate. That was a crapshoot then, and that's a crapshoot now. If that's your goal, that's fine. Nothing wrong with that, but understand it's a 3% admit rate from uh, an applicant pool that is worldwide. Um, most colleges have admit rates in the 40 and 50 and 60. The average admit rate at uh, in private universities, I think, is 65%. So there are great schools with admit rates of 65%, I'm just telling you. So um, take the broad perspective here. And it's true that American higher education is still the envy um, of, of the world because of our diversity of types of institutions that we, we have land-grant institutions, we have institutions within each of our states that have a responsibility to educate our citizens in those, in those states. And so the definition of privilege depends on the mission and, and expectation of, of, of each of those um, different institutions. And as was said, um, overcoming adversity, grit is another sexy word that's been, been used in the last 10 years, are two examples of attributes of which there is a panoply that we are seeking. You know, fundamentally we are educational institutions, so our number one goal should be to seek students who are curious, who are excited about learning. But there, every one of us has different attributes that we will bring, just like we have different experiences intellectual preferences, and I would say that we are getting better at um, eliciting those from students' applications. And so, yes, sometimes the questions we ask are, are more refined and help us, trying to get a sense more of your personality traits than just your accomplishments. Um, an institution I used to work for, um, I was happy to see, still has amongst its supplemental questions, tell us about a quirk that you have. And, and where it comes from. Something that's, that's quirky about you, you know, I, I bite my nails, for example, right? I, things that like just m sort of make you you and, and you may not even know it, your friends may be the ones to have to tell you about it. So yes, we are constantly trying to learn more about you, but all those, that's where those questions really, really do come from. But the number one uh, supplemental question we all ask is what? What do you think? Many, many, many of us ask on an application. <laughs> Down in front. <laughs> what would you think? It's why our institution. What, you know, we talked about demonstrated interest. What is it, have, have you done the homework about our institution? NYU is the best. It says, besides the fact that we're in Manhattan, why would you like to come to our institution? We, again, are, are asking of you, what are those things that, that excite you so that we can help understand who you are and what you might, might bring? So uh, could you talk a little bit from your experiences about uh, college campus tours? Uh, so if we were planning to go and visit several colleges and how much time do we allot for a, a college and besides signing up for that uh, obligatory tour that they do and walking around campus, are there other things we should be signing up for or communicating to people like yourselves, setting up at private meetings, that sort of thing? Yeah, the um, typical tour information session is usually gonna be about two hours. Um, I usually advise uh, families to think about the other colleges and universities in a particular location. Um, so perhaps you can do a couple in a day. So my colleague who went to GW, we, we often get students who go visit GW, Georgetown, and American in the same day. Um, when I was in North Carolina, they would do a, a stretch on 85. So Elon, Carolina, NC State, that sort of thing. Um, so those are the typical you know, tours and information sessions. If you've really done some digging on an institution and you know that this is probably gonna be one of your top choices, 
Um, you may want to explore uh, meetings or opportunities or specialty tours within a department. Um, so again, at American, um, our School of Public Affairs is very popular. They host a specific tour just to learn about how you can study political science and policy in the District of Columbia. Um, so they're very specialty tours, and so that may be of interest. Um, if you're thinking about the performing arts, um, perhaps scheduling a audition, the school may require an audition of some kind um, to learn about the performing arts and, and those sorts of things. So I think that um, websites are gonna be a great place to start. Um, all of us have on our websites where you can sign up for those tours and information sessions, and then we'll often direct you to the other departments if those other departments or schools offer specialty tours while you're on campus for the day. Um, but I'd also tell students to take, go off the beaten path sometimes and just stop random students who are not our um, either volunteer or paid ambassadors and ask them about the institution, what they like about the institution, what they like about the town and the community. Um, explore the community where you're going to be going to school. So um, explore either Washington, D.C., explore the college town where the um, school is located just to see types of restaurants, what type of community. Um, me personally, being a person of color, you know, it's important to know that there are going to be other people of color in my community or where am I going to go get my hair done, um, those sorts of things. And so think about those things as well um, as you're going to the college tours and learning more about the community. The last thing I'll say about this, once the student has been admitted, most of us will host some sort of either open house or programming for admitted students where you can get those more in-depth questions about living and life as a student at that institution. Um, asking those really deep questions about, okay, I'm about to spend four years at this place, why should I be here? Um, and getting those uh, questions answered from students, learning about the processes, the support that students are gonna receive at the institution. Um, and so you'll have those opportunities, especially once the student has been admitted um, to the university. There's not a better return on investment uh, than the campus visit. There, there's just not. You know, it's a, a tank of gas, maybe it's a plane flight, maybe it's a, 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 a night or several nights in a hotel, but when we're talking about a four-year investment, um, it is just critically important. And yes, uh, you all live in the South. You know that azaleas don't bloom year-round, right? They only bloom for like three weeks out of the year. But maybe on a website, you see blooming azaleas all the time, and you know that's just not reality. Um, spending time on campus, seeing what people look like when it's not a big football game day on a Saturday. What's it like when it's raining <laughs> and it's 45 degrees and it's the middle of the week, you know? Um, what is it like then? And so really just understanding that as much money as we spend on um, marketing to you all and, and sharing about our brand, there's a level of authenticity that you get to experience by peeling back the layers and you do that when you visit. So the questions that you just asked us are the exact same questions you should ask the schools that you're considering visiting to understand who might offer what. I'm sorry, but there's a sort of an irony to it, which is um, that some of the most uh, insightful moments are our, ha our happenstance and serendipitous on a college campus when somebody gets lost uh, trying to find the admission office and you run into several people or you, um, you um, happen to see somebody walking a dog that's like your dog and he ends up being a biology professor and they, you know, what, the stories that like that. But at the same time, if there are things, very specific things that you know are important, don't leave it to chance for them to, become, to be available for you because we can't promise that the biology professor is gonna, going to be in his or her lab. Right now, we can't promise that all of our buildings will be, uh, will be open, but we can promise that those things that we are sharing with you on our websites are available, um, and the linkage to coaches' emails to those, to those individuals, so that even if you're not able to meet with them, you've made a, you've, you've made a contact. Um, and where you can see, we know you're busy students, but where you can be the one reaching out to those individuals, the better. 
You're the one going to, to school. We recognize that it's hard for you to find time to make those appointments and, and schedule all those things, especially if it requires a call. We get that. But when it comes to actually wanting to meet with, with someone, you, the student, should really be the one writing. I am very conscious of your time tonight. So um, I have, we'll, we'll stop on the Q&A, but um, I have a couple of announcements and um, and then I think Ms. Cover would like to also talk um, just briefly. So um, for the juniors in the room, um, you know that you have a case study program tomorrow and, and should have read about our four applicants that we will all be discussing. These are your committee leaders. Um, and so you will get to spend some great time with them tomorrow discussing college applications and learning a little bit more about the ins and outs of that review process. Um, for the parents in the room of juniors, if you have not submitted your parent survey in SCORE that is still open and still available for you to brag on your daughter and share a little bit about what you love about her and how amazing she is, if for some reason SCORE is just not your jam and you can't figure it out quite yet, um, I did email you the questions. Search for an email from me recently and you've got those questions. I'm happy to send them again to you. I value your input so much in getting to know your daughter. Um, I also want to give a thanks to Brian McCutcheon for helping with sound tonight, um, Ella Harris on lighting, Bell Wallen on our live stream. Am I missing any of the good folks up there? I really just, what? Where is he? Oh, you're in the darkness, Mr. Wright. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate everyone's help tonight, and I am going to let Ms. Cover say a few words, and, um, and then we will be able to thank our guests here at the very end. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for spending Thursday night talking about the future. I really want to thank Ms. Mann for organizing a fantastic night. I think this is wonderful. A round of applause, please. Thank you. I want to thank our guests, and I, it always amazes me. I've listened to a lot of these panels and had a lot of different um, uh, colleagues up here and, and experts, and I always learn something new, and, and I'm amazed at how different your universities and colleges are, but how a lot of you know the principles and everything you do, the thoughtfulness that goes into what you do. So thank you so much, and thank you for being here live. We are so appreciative. Um, I'm going to join you as a, as a fellow parent in the class of 2023, and so this this, this for me is the fun part, folks, and I hope that all of you embrace um, this time of exploration, discovery, and just um, really, for lack of a better word, getting onto these campuses, whether it's virtual or in person, and feeling that 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 feeling in your stomach, that gut reaction um, as to whether you know you are called to visit the campus or dig deeper. And there's nothing more fun than watching your daughter get on campus and either unfortunately do that, shut down and say I'm leaving right away, or more importantly, watch her kind of you know hit her stride and, and, and look around and you can kind of see her walk a little taller and, and say, you know, I think I could see myself here. So it is a beautiful, beautiful experience. So I hope you have a lot of fun with it. You also have an incredible college counseling office here with Miss Mann, and um, we are actually going to have a reception or a meet and greet out here to introduce Mr. Andrew Reich, who is here from Richmond, Virginia. He is right here down below. So let's give him a warm GPS welcome. Um, he spent the day here today, and he will be here tomorrow for the um, for the the um, dean's. Um, what are we calling it? The case studies. Um, he will be joining us here next year. He will be here on campus several times. A little plug, we have sent out a couple notes to um, the junior class about setting up appointments with Mr. Reich. He's meeting with students in person tomorrow and Saturday, and he'll be here a couple times on campus between now and when his family moves, but he also is offering several Zoom uh, appointments. So make sure that you sign up for that. But he will be out there so you can meet and greet him. Um, and again, just enjoy the ride, enjoy the journey, and I want to thank you again so much for, for your time and your energy tonight. One last thanks before everybody leaves. If you all will look around, you will see your teachers and other members of our staff, faculty at GPS here. This is a family affair. 
We are all in this together. I want to thank them for giving up their evenings and being here with us tonight to learn about what you all are going through over the next year. So everybody be safe going home. We'll see you in the morning. Thanks to our wonderful panel.